Hi, Dean. Yeah. Allison, how are you? How the fuck are you? I mean, I'm probably the same. I'm just, you know, I'm just here. I'm just here. That's it. Yeah, where you at? You're in Nashville, right? Yeah. Now, you have a place in L.A. Did you get trapped in Nashville, or did you prefer to be locked down out there? I got trapped here, but it's probably best that I'm trapped here because this is where my studio and all my shit is. So it's kind of better. I have more to yeah. do, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, uh, I'm in, right now I'm in my uh, truck in Atwater Village, which is uh, fastly becoming my favorite neighborhood in LA. Just in and your car? I, well, I sit around here and think, Man, I should have bought something. <laughs> you just you know, sit around in your car and you feel remorse. That's no, what's, hap what's happening as I see you smoking your cigarette is I moved into a new apartment and um, in three days realized the neighbor smokes and is coming into my place. Yeah. And I was like, I got to get the fuck out of here. So I didn't get Wi-Fi hooked up. Um, or, or you know the internet because I know I'm leaving. I've only been in there for a few weeks, and it's just oh man, it's and, and I think I'm, I'm at a point in my life where I'm just like wow, like I have no regrets at all, zero. But now at night I think uh, my only regret is I should have bought some. But I think that I would have bought it and then, you know, been like, oh, well, I like this neighborhood better. And then, you know, I'm slowly finding a place I want to spend the rest of my life. I'm at that age, you know? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, uh, keep it's driving funny. around, man. Just keep driving around and parking and sitting and. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, got no I got no problem doing it, actually. I wouldn't be surprised if the show got picked up as like, we like how you interview, interview people in your uh, truck. <laughs> the tech the technology is so insane now that you could just interview someone in a goddamn truck in a neighborhood <laughs> you can't right? do it right now yeah i'm in i'm in atwater village have you been to this neighborhood ever yes i go there almost every day when i'm in la because my bloody studio is there yeah so i just watched the beastie boys documentary and I realized when I first heard about Silver Lake and East um, Hollywood was all the way back when they did um, Paul's Boutique and the Hey Ladies yeah. video and they were living in that mansion. And then they recorded over here on, in Atwater, which is just incredible to think how far ahead of time they were back then. Like, this looks good. It's got vibe. And that was back when it was like gangster and, and yeah. there they are making some of the greatest music ever, right? Yeah. I'm only halfway through the document. I mean, maybe like a third of the way through it. It's so good that I'm watching it in little pieces because I don't want it to run out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's funny. It's funny about the Beastie Boys. Is today your birthday, by the way? My birthday? No. It's my friend Mariella's birthday in Mexico. Oh, I got you. Yeah. So I saw you on Instagram, but. I realized as I watched the Beastie Boys documentary, it's just these, each record was these periods of time in my life. And they're so incredible how they pop up. Like, wow, I know who I was hanging out with during that time. I know where I lived and everything on each record. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It's amazing because music has that power. It's insane. It remember it like you reminds you like what something smells like when you listen to something. You can remember like, what your house or your neighborhood smelled like or anything. It's crazy. It really is. I always say most people, uh, you know, when they say there's no good music anymore, they really mean that uh, there's no music that, it, the music is like a time machine for them. It takes them back to when they didn't have bills or a okay. divorce or yeah. student loans. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they don't really mean there's no good music. They're like, there's they just no good having music. a good life now. They don't want right. to have this part of their life. Yeah. 100% because there's so much good music right now. I can't even keep up with it. Mm -hmm. I forget all of it. I get at least 
10 bands a month that I think are incredible, which is blowing my mind right now. That means you're having a happy life, Dean. Yeah. Yeah, as shitty as my apartment thing is, everything else is fantastic. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just a... a so funny. A, it's such a nightmare, right? Ever since you've known me, I'm like, hey, you got a bungalow in the back I can live in, remember? <laughs> yeah. When you got your place? I was like, hey, can I move in? <laughs> can I sleep in your yard? Is that cool? It's a... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> You know what I'm you know what I'm obsessed with and and I know that you would dig this because the thing I love about you is uh you're not just your music but you're just so into all kinds of cool shit like art and everything. I'm obsessed with container homes lately. Really? You, you know what those are? Yeah. 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 yeah there's feels, people there's people It's like a hallway though, right? I mean it's pretty long and narrow. When, well, what they do now is they put them side by side, side by side, and turn them into these full mid-century masterpieces. Yeah, they're taking it to another level, man. And and you know, you just throw one up out in Joshua Tree and disappear, <laughs> away from the virus, right? Just far away from the virus and just melt in the sun. Absolutely. Yeah. I saw. Th- I, I saw that you were talking about the new Lucinda Williams record. And by the way, this is the first time I've been seen without a beard in years. I had to shave it off because I was just wearing a mask all the time. Oh, yeah. And it's, per- it's pretty strange to see your face after it's covered for so long. Yeah. Um, and mostly because as you start to age, your skin and everything sags. And you realize, oh, this is, uh, this is me getting older. And it's incredible. And the reason I bring this up is Lucinda Williams' new record, uh, you know, she's making better music now than ever besides Car Wheels. That, isn't it? That's I know. But isn't it just, I mean, they're two totally different types of records, though. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This new record is absolutely bananas. It's so good. The music is so good. The sounds are so good. Her voice is so good. The lyrics are so good. It's so good. I've been listening to it all the time. I love it. I just love it too because it a lot because people they cast everybody out after a certain age. You know, not just women. Uh, I've I've dealt with ageism uh, big time in the comedy uh, uh, world, and thank God I could make my own uh, groove with uh, podcasting and and all that stuff. But uh, it's great because. You know, people look at like Willie Nelson turned 87 two days ago. Really? And this guy, in the last couple of years, yeah, he's putting out music that's blowing my mind with his kids and stuff. Yeah. It's awesome. It, it is. It is awesome. I mean, I guess if you just love what you're doing and you love it so hard, you're just going to always keep on doing it. People respond to that, you know. They respond to the fact that you have no choice. You wake up in the morning and you're like, I'm sorry, this is what I'm doing. I'm not going to stop, you know. And by the way, I love yeah, yeah. wearing gloves in the car. Can I see those on the screen really quickly? Those are really nice. Yeah. Those are great. <laughs> you know. Right? Are you going to Did you plan to leave your vehicle today? Or are you going to just stay there and then drive back to like the smoke box? What are you going to do? Well, I go back to the smoke box. I go back to the smoke box every evening. You know what I'm saying? You know what's funny? Is I smoked for so long. Like you, you just love them, you know? Yeah. And there came a point in my life where I was like, I don't dig these anymore. And it was really about maintenance, like heroin. I would have one in the morning that I loved, and I have one after the meal that I loved. Those are two amazing ones. And then uh, if I ever had sex, you know, uh, I'd have one after that. But other than that, they were all maintenance, just over and over, like, ugh, ugh. To me, that's what happened. I just burned out on them. That's great. I really hope I burn out on them. We'll see. Oh, yeah, you will. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How long have you been smoking? Um. Seven, eight, 17 and a half years. Wow. Wow. It's, it's a long time. It's funny. It's a long time. 
I'll yeah. never get those 17 and a half years back, you know? That's just <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, when you look at it, you know, like most people haven't done anything for 17 years, you know, straight, <laughs> like a relationship. I am loyal to my projects. I'm very loyal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit. I haven't had you on in years. Last time we did it, uh, much more luxurious. We were in the uh, Chateau Marmont. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't in my pickup, and we weren't locked down on a on a virus. And it was one of it was one of my favorite episodes because we just didn't do podcasts, and it meant a lot to me, you know, for you to do it. And uh, we've become good friends since then, which is great. You've come to see comedy. I've, I've gone to see you live uh, many times. And uh, I love your world, man. And your art world, that is blowing my mind also, the paintings and stuff. Thank let's you. talk. Let's talk a little bit about how you got into paintings, because I went to your show there in L.A., and it was, it was electric. Some of it was kind of Stedman, right? Would you th would you think? Well, I grew, you know, I, I always loved Hunter S. Thompson growing up. That was one of my favorite writers. So I, I that's how I found out about Stedman, and I love Stedman. I wish I could draw like, I mean, it's just incredible what he does. But I'm messy like that, and I use a lot of ink, and I kind of use things in that manner, but he is far more controlled. He is, he's spectacular. Um but I, you know, doing art shows is really fun. It's really scary. There's a lot of adrenaline involved. It's like terrifying to bring all that stuff from like your own private, you know, you spend so much time alone with those things, making those things, and then to put them on a wall and invite the world to come in and hang out with it. Uh, it's a really interesting experience for sure. I, I quite like it. It's definitely a lot like being a singer. Um... You can hide behind your instrument, guitar, drums, bass, or anything, but you remember the first time you're in a studio and the, the producer soloed up your vocal? Let's listen to that real quick, and you're like, ah! Yeah. That's so what an art, art show is like. You're soloing up your vocal uh, about 20 times on the wall, you know? <laughs> yeah. The, the, the feeling of that, because you're going in, I know you, I know your music, and... Uh, okay, let's go in and see what this is. And then you go in and you're like, oh shit, it's good, thank God. You know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Otherwise, this would be embarrassing and I just have to back out of the door. <laughs> yeah, just be like, it's good, I got a set, man, thank you. It, it just fucking blows, but it was, it's really, really good stuff. And it sold like crazy. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, right? I mean, that shit sold. That yeah, show. yeah, it did. It did. It sold a lot in LA. LA is a good place for my art, apparently. You know, I mean, I've had art shows a lot of places, and it's usually a lot harder to sell things. Um, yeah. Um, in New York, like, it's really hard to sell something big because everyone lives in a place that is small, you know? And then, but in, like, LA, I think that, um, I don't know. That was, it was surprising to me and awesome, you know? Well, Los Angeles is really where I learned about that kind of, uh, like just a, a whole art world, the Juxtapose magazine, the Todd Shores, the Robert Williams, the Mark Rydens, all that stuff. Years and years and years ago, I go to these funky little shows on Melrose and people like Mary Karnowski was putting on these huge shows and of these incredible artists uh, and I was just kind of uh, I, I was immediately hooked onto that art world it, and, and the people rock too that were involved yeah I think the art scene's really awesome in LA for sure it's so so awesome it's a totally different vibe I mean the art world's awesome in New York but it's a completely different vibe and there's definitely a need for both you know it's a kind of just a different energy entirely. I love it. When you're when you're painting, are you like like what is the the vibe of painting? Are you completely outside of music box? Okay, I'm going to be into painting box, 
because obviously your brain creates pretty pretty kick ass. You write lyrics, you write music, and now you're painting. But is it a uh, a, a different like just mindset? Because I can't draw shit, but I can I can tell jokes, I can write jokes, and write music, but I cannot draw. So we always like a person that can draw. Yeah. Um, I really, you know, I grew up with like, I was really into skateboarding when I was little and I loved like all graphics, skateboard graphics, like the whole Power Peralta sort of vibe. And I would draw all of that stuff when I was little, but I always drew, my mom was a high school art teacher. She just, uh, when I was tiny, tiny, she just sat me down with paint, you know, and pens and markers and crayons or whatever. And I immediately took to it. I loved it. I, she could just leave me there for like six hours and I wouldn't move. I would just be like lost in it. So um, it's always been a really great form of escapism and, uh, you know, express, expression, like expressing like how I felt, you know, much easier for me than talking. Much like music is, it's much easier for me to scream at thousands of people on stage than it is it me to have a conversation with a stranger, you know, it's just, beyond me i get like yeah. so i don't know but i do i do love it it feels good painting though what you're asking about like the music do i go into like one zone and another zone um kind of both it's like if i'm if i'm here right now in my studio if i were at home making artwork then i'm surrounded by my guitars too so like say i'll get stuck on a painting and i'll pick up a guitar and i'll work on a song and then i'll get stuck on that and i'll go back to the painting and i just like move around like a vulture in a circle in this room all the time so whatever grabs my attention i'll get going on that so it's quite nice to be able to do that but there have been shows or times um where i am painting for a show in a location and that is all i do and i'll go spend like 15 hours a day there and i'll just be painting so the last show I did in LA, I don't know if you were at that one, the Los Trachos show, which was, what was that? Um, it was at the F, F155 gallery, 105 gallery. Um, that whole show was painted in that gallery. So we just covered the whole place in plastic, painted the show, pulled the plastic down, hung the pieces on the wall. And that was wow. like a, a month long process. And it was so fun. It was so, so, so fun. So they let you in the the uh, building for a month to, to create the paintings? Yeah, yeah. I had keys, I came in the back door, you know, we like kind of shuttered the whole front of the building and and I would come in at all hours of the day, you know, and just stay and work all day and all night and go home and sleep and come right back. And, and it was a kind of similar experience to the show I had right before that, which was in Mexico City. It was a residency and I got to work on this rooftop studio in downtown Mexico City, and um, and I would just uh, I'd go there at like noon, and then I'd run back to my hotel room at four o'clock in the morning, and then I'd go back there at noon and run back, you know, and I just lived in that. So I wasn't playing music; I was just painting. It's kind of different, you know, to have to be that extremely focused and have a deadline. It produces that's, different kind of work. That's why you did a show in Mexico City. You know, one of my favorites ever. I was wow. best experience. I was there for two weeks and I painted, I think my show had like 76 pieces in it or something crazy. Did they all sell down there? No, I think about 25% of them sold. Um, they're still selling, you know, it was a massive, massive show. Wow, how did that get set up? Uh, well, a girl whose happy birthday I wished today, she's the girl that brought me to Mexico City. She's the one that set it up. She's in, she like does lots of stuff with the art world in Mexico. So um, they were doing these residencies and she asked me if she, if I wanted to come and it was like, I get to come to Mexico city for two weeks and paint. Oh yes. I'll be there. Hell wow. yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. It was one of the best experiences of my life. Literally. Yeah. The so incredible. Man. Yeah. I love it. Let's, let's get a little bit about uh, what's going on with you musically. I, uh, of course, we're going to talk about your new single and your video, but the last that we, I think the last time was right when the, the last Dead Weather came out. You guys had that secret rec release, remember, at uh, three, three Clubs? Yeah. Uh, and we were hanging out pretty hard then. 
Um, and then you went on, you did the Kills record. And now where are we with uh, either of those projects? I know Jack White, he, he seems to be firing up stuff from the past, you know? Um, you think that'll ever happen again? I think it will happen again, but I have no idea when. And that band right. has always been like kind of magic trick. It's sort of like, it only works if everyone's home at the same time and no one has like a record they're about to go record and a tour they're about to go on for three straight years, which is always what happens when you have four people all in different bands that are all, you know, full-time bands. So right. it's, um, we'll see, you know, I never know. I'll get the call and just be there and do it. But right now, Jamie and I are writing a Kills record. So that's happening over, I mean, you know, I'm sending each other things back and forth from LA. I swear to God, I need to get back to LA. I need to like Mad Max it across the country in my car. Cause this is gonna come to point. I know. But where do I sleep? And do I have to wear those gloves you're wearing? And all of the questions that I have. I, the reason I wear the gloves, and it's so fucking crazy what's going on right now. Our, our lives is it's so spooky. But, you know, like, you don't realize how much you touch yourself until you're not supposed to touch yourself, your face. And I watch people as they're talking on these Zoom shows and stuff, and they're just touching their faces, and I'm just kind of like... Constantly. Yeah, yeah. and so... Do those mostly, make you not touch your face? Well, yeah, because I kind of got, like, gloves on, you know, and, and it reminds me they're fucking turquoise gloves. There's this big and, turquoise plastic thing coming at your face, and you say no, 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 yeah, no. no. Yeah. Okay. Also, also, what it does to me is it's the old no glove, no love. You know, I uh, I get home, I take the gloves off, I throw them in the garbage can, and then I I shower, and it's kind of like a freedom of like, all right, well I know there's nothing on my hands because I had gloves on, and um, I don't know. There was a time, and and I uh, I was pretty honest about it with some friends, but. At first, I kind of joked about the virus. I was in Austin the day that they uh, canceled South by Southwest. I was headlining a show there. Mm -hmm. And I landed, right when I landed, it said Austin, uh, South by Southwest canceled. Mm -hmm. On the front page, as I was getting off the plane, I was walking down the uh, airport. And I was like, God, man, they're, they're taking that pretty fucking serious. That's, that's stupid. That's what I said. And... Um, I hung out with Chris Layton all day and we uh, from Double Trouble and we did a podcast and I went and did my show and it was sold out. And I noticed about 30 people didn't show up that were uh, paid tickets, you know, $40. And I was yeah. kind of like, well, there's some people that are scared. And then when I got home, I started to kind of freak out because I was like, man, you know, I don't, I don't want to get sick. I've been... Uh, I'm, you know, it, it's just crazy. You know, like uh, my friends had it. They were on tour. Death Angel, Testament, and Exodus were on this big tour in Europe. And they got back and all of a sudden I knew people that had it. Of course, yeah. in my mind, I'm like, well, they were on tour in Italy, so okay. But yeah. still, it started to get scary. Were they okay? Now, yeah, they all made it out. Thank God. Thank God. But it was really scary because I just had some of these guys on my podcast a month before, mm -hmm. uh, just a month before. So then it started to uh, freak me out a little bit. And then, um, and then I just kind of got lost. Like what is going on with life right now? And there's these people that are conspiracy. Oh, this is a government. And there's other people that are like, it ain't bad. I'm doing this. And I'm just trying to just figure out, figure out my way through this and I'm a yeah. single guy live alone and you know some noises start happening in your head and you try to you try to get through it you know yeah yeah Absolutely. and of course like you we travel for a living and I lost all my work for the year and yeah. uh it's gone so and same with you right I mean you can make a record which is fantastic but I don't get off on doing comedy on a zoom show i to me 
comedy hey, man, is just, I don't yeah, do live music on Instagram live or like all that. I don't, you know, I don't want to, that's, I appreciate the people that are finding that fulfilling, but Same, as yeah. an artist, the thing I love is the communication and the feedback, the energy, you know, I work with that and I don't get, it's so one-sided. I, I can't, it doesn't really work with my brain. <clears throat> I don't mind talking on it. That's okay. But you know, the art form. Yeah, itself, same, same here. Right. Exactly. Art form itself is, it requires a circular energy, you know, comedy. Absolutely. It's like, how do you know if you're, if that went over well, you just, you're just in the dark. You're totally in the dark. So, um, it's an interesting thing. Uh, I feel lucky because I didn't have any shows booked. I'm just at that weird point in that cycle where, I'm writing, so it's like a very insular experience anyway. However, I do travel constantly because I do so many different things, you know, and all of a sudden that's just like shut down. Like I don't, I have never been home for this long in my whole life. It's day 50 today. Never in my life. Not since I'm I was the, a little kid in junior yeah. high have I been home I'm, this long. I'm so, the same way. I've been, uh, I've been on the in the biz for 36 years now and i'm a workaholic uh, yeah. mostly because it's check to check but um like i said I, i've loved my life and there's a scary part to me and i don't know if this happens to you let's uh, let's get into this for a minute there's a scary part to me where you idle so long that you start to go hey this ain't that bad like the roots of it start to really fucking scary. go in. It's truly really scary. Yeah. You know, even though when there's like, I, I've noticed it in myself, which is so, it's worrying me. It's like, okay, there's people in my town who I have, I have seen like my, my brother, my niece, because we didn't see each other for six weeks. So stayed because I was like, I can't live without my niece and my brother who live across town. So I will do everything so that I know that I'm okay and I can go and see them. And, um, you know, and then even having that release of like some other kind of like face-to-face -face communication, cuddling my news. I mean, like the hugest possible thing that could happen. And, um, but at this point, it's like motivating myself to go out of the house to get in my car and like put the mask on and do the things and all this stuff. Um, it's strange what my brain is doing because none of this is complicated, you know? Right. And it could be a joyous, like, I'm going, but like the motivation is really strange. And so, I don't know, I'm getting so used to being confined in these four walls that maybe this is what it's like when people go to jail for a really long time and they go home and they just want to go back. I don't know. Oh yeah, 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 what do they call that? It's uh, it's some kind of syndrome, I forget, but yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. It's don't just kind of like, like be anymore in this other thing. I mean, yeah, it's terrifying for the whole human race, I would say. Right. I, I'll do everything in my power to knock that shit out of me when this is over, but like, you're, you're basically coping, and you're coping and your brain is telling you, no, this is okay. And that's how you have to cope is you have to accept it and just be all right. But then we all are going to have to turn that off at some point. And that's going to be hard. Yo, Dean, you froze. You froze. All you right. want to hear the, you want to hear the funniest thing that happened? You get towed? Right oh my God. Here, here's, what, here, here's what's amazing about uh, this new world my phone actually heated up I was, <laughs> was just, I was i was chilling in the sun right and it said phone temperature too hot must cool <laughs> off i'm like what what the fuck are you talking about yeah oh my god isn't that hilarious yeah that's never happened to my phone maybe you should just back, back under like a tree in the shade or something i did i just moved over to the shade and you know what's funny was i didn't want to say anything to you but i was fucking cooking I was, I was <laughs> cooking. Throw a window down dude i did i did but it was like 
I was perfectly in the Dude, sun. Find an oak. Find an oak tree. I'm under it now. There you I'm go. I'm under it now. All right. I'm gonna. Oh my god. Oh my god. You again and uh, let you guys get That's back. so fuck. God damn it. <laughs> How fucking funny is that? My phone heated. My phone heated up and just shut off. <laughs> That's only happened to me one time before. I was riding through the uh, desert on my motorcycle, and, and I got to right before Coachella, and I whipped out my phone and it said, "Phone too hot." And I'm like, "Hey man, I got, I got to call the guy to get backstage." You know what I'm saying? You just put it in a bucket of ice real quick. Just get it down. So, yeah, so I'm blowing on it. It's 107 at Coachella. I'm like. On my phone, I've got to get a hold of Bill Fold to get backstage, and I'm trapped. I, I've never. Oh, I tell you what, man, we are so fucked. When our phone, if 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 we're in the virus right now, we're just one step away from road warrior shit, you know. And all we have to do to wipe people out is just take their phone. There's nothing else you have to do. You don't have to do anything else to wipe a person out, but take their phone. It's true. Right? And they're, and they're fucking done. They're like, my phone. <laughs> it's insane the life we're in right now. Oh, my God. I love talking to you. <laughs> it's insane. It is insane. You need to get some backup phones and some, like, coolers for your phone. You should store your phones in little phone coolers. That will be the next thing Apple comes out with. The phone, phone cool. <laughs> Actually, just like a fan. You know those ones? You ever see somebody have a fan on their hat? Like at a, at a football game or baseball game? They got a dumb battery oh, fan. Yeah. yeah, get one of those on the back of the phone. Right now, I'm just letting the fucking AC just kick it, man. That's, that's so crazy. Right? Oh, oh, I just, I want to know all the people about water, what they're thinking about you right now. Where did you oh, yeah. check what's yeah. happening now? <laughs> good, good, good thing I'm not in a, uh, like, like if I was just in some kind of van, you know? <laughs> like, like just a van, they'd be like, hey, there's a dude out there with a fresh fucking shave, looks like a <laughs> lunatic, and he's just sitting in his van. Looking what? at his face for the first time. Just staring at his own face for the first time, just wondering what's going on. <laughs> let me let me show you real quick what kind of shit I fucking like right here. Let's see if I can okay. reverse my cam. This is the kind of shit. Don't I'm like in. your car's on, remember? Don't let it roll away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Like, look at this badass. Like, can you see that, that yeah. Spanish bungalow? It's awesome. And these, these are amazing. Like, look at this one with the old cactuses and shit. Wait. What street are you on? Uh, Glen Feliz. Okay. Yeah. So basically, what you want to do when you come over the Hyperion Bridge. Oh, I know that street. I mean, you're so close to where I actually live. I just drive down. Really? The and then list. Yeah. I drive I right to the bar every I day. I won't say where you're at, but I thought you were uh, a little more west. Uh-uh. Just ahead. Hollywood. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're Hollywood, right? Yeah, I'm really close to like uh, the Oaks. The Oaks. Oh, oh, yeah, right. Exactly. That's what I thought. But I'm saying yeah. this is this is like, you know, I always explain to people how the neighborhoods go here. If you you're into East Side, it goes Beechwood, Los Feliz, uh, uh, Silver Lake, Echo Park, and off to the side would be Atwater Village. Mm -hmm. And all of East LA is just fucking that soul, man. I you think know? Atwater Village is just so cool because the streets, it's like flats, but it, you're just so close to everything and all the houses are so cool. They're well, so cool. what you get, and, and you get the Highland Park architecture, but you're not way out there. Yeah. So that's the beauty of it, you know? Yeah. What are you, what are you hearing um, on the in on the inside as far as industry like your managers or your agents or anything are you hearing anything of like this is just done for 2020 yeah, well for touring yeah i mean i think touring on a real real scale is probably done until 2022 2022 
or or a, a vaccine. Yeah, but you know, vaccines. I don't know. You know, I'm. I don't know. I don't know how all that works. This is the first time I've ever even thought about any of these things. But but we'll have a vaccine before then. But to get it is not going to be easy. You know. Right. Then it's right. another year to actually get one. And there's definitely a lot of people that would get in line to get that far before me, you know, like every older person or person with anything going on first, you know. Right. Um, <coughs> so I think we're going to have to get creative. I think we're going to be able to do things in public, but I think they're going to have to be smaller. They're going to have to be someone's, I mean, we're going to have to be creative and do something interesting because we can't do things just the way we did. And I think my biggest fear is that all my favorite independent theaters all over the country and all over the world, all these beautiful places, these like incredible places will probably be bought up by like, you know, whoever I don't want, I, to, you know, I get I, it. I get like, it. Are they going to be there? Am I ever going to get to play those places again? What about that hotel? I love that's been there for hundreds of years. What about that bar, that cool dive bar? What, you know, like, I feel like the next time I go on tour, it's going to be like, really, I'll be so excited, but it's going to be like this strange, every city I get to, my brain is going to be like, let's go, you know, to all my places, my spots, you know, you got your spots. And this constant funeral feeling of like, fuck, it's gone. I'm terrified. I mean, I'm, I'm already sad about it. It's like, again, that coping thing where I'm like, allowing myself to let go of things that are so meaningful to me and be thankful that I at least got to spend the time that I did because we're going to start doing something new. It's going to be new. New things are going to happen that are incredible, you know, but yeah, yeah, it's just going to be an interesting psychology for a number of years, I think. So I try to have a word with myself about that constantly. It's really bizarre, right? How just like all of a sudden I, I kind of, um, I kind of put it in this analogy you or I or anybody in the entertainment business, it's kind of like you trained all your life <clears throat> to get into the NFL and then you had a career ending injury and never got to play again. It's wild. Like also I was I was telling somebody that and they go, well that's not true because an injury and you can't play you're not injured and this will, you know, go away. And I'm just like, well we don't know that. We don't know if there's going to be venues around, if they survive. We don't know if we're going to be able to have more than 100, 200 people, which makes it hard to tour because what are you going to have? $2,000 tickets? <clears throat> what, you know, what, what are you going to do? So well, I we mean, don't that's know. The thing where ideally, like the interesting part of this is that it's happening to everybody, to the whole world, to every business, to everything. And it's like, right. Perhaps money is worth less, you know, perhaps rent is less, perhaps everything kind of goes down to a level where it's sustainable. I mean, I think that is really uh, hopeful thinking, but there's going to just be, so, I mean, there's so many people out of work. There's so many things. It's like all, every facet, you know? So I don't know. It's like, yeah, it's probably not going to be possible to tour if you're only playing in front of 200 people. I know I've done that. I mean, that's when you sleep on a floor and you don't, mm -hmm you know, right. eat, right. Um, and you play every single night and you drive yourself like 10 hours to the next place right off stage. And you're, you know, you're oh, yeah. 20, so you can do that. Um, uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know. But yeah. I, I think your analogy <clears throat> about the NFL player is actually quite correct because I think that a lot of people are experiencing that. There are a lot of like literal people that have trained and have a window especially in sports, you know, have a window, like everyone going to the Olympics, like that, there's a lot of those people that will not get to sell, you know, yeah. well, like yeah. aged out. They'll, they, and it's like, cause it's such a small window. You've been working for that your entire life and then that's done. Like, all right, what, what now, you know? Um, that's the scary thing to me because <laughs> I started comedy so late, 44 years old. And here I am at 54. And about three months ago, I truly felt, I truly felt like I was like, wow, man, I am really 
some place in my life right now that is beyond like anything I ever thought. I was like, this is incredible what's happening. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 and if it all went away, I would be like, well, you know what? Fuck man. I had 10 amazing years, but, uh, I always think in a reality way of like, fuck man. I, I don't know. I really don't know. And, and, you know, but I don't let it get me down because I'm definitely down for an adventure. I mean, I started comedy as yeah. an old man. So yeah. I, I'm down for an adventure, of course, you know, and thanks for I've been doing this podcast. Me too. I'm, I'm a down for an adventure too. And I'm also open to kind of rethinking and reimagining how we can do our job in a way that is safe and other people can be involved with, you know, especially like in the live realm. I think, I think we're going to be doing a lot more stuff outside. Yeah. Like there's drive-in theaters. Did you see that concert a couple of days ago? No, I didn't see it. It was like in New Zealand. They had a drive-in theater, the band set up at the screen and then people were just in their cars rocking, man. That's awesome. I know. You know? I love that. But they'll, yeah, but there'll be like cool, weird things where it's like, okay, you see like the seating arrangement, but it's all set up. You have to do things outside because if you want to fit people, there's got to be tons of space. But this is just like the next couple of years. And right. then gradually we'll be able to go back to places that we know, willing that they exist, yeah. you know, or figuring out how to get them back. But um, I don't know. It's just going to be really interesting. I'm, I am really glad to witness this in my lifetime you know it's strange I keep thinking about people that I know and friends and family who have passed in the last sort of five or six years they would have been like dazzled by this like it's it's the strangest time on earth I'm glad oh. not to miss it even though it's a fucking pain in the ass you know it's like this is there's never been one thing in the world that has really truly united every single person in the world. But this, that I, right. you know? Um, so it's really interesting and I'm glad to see it. And I'm curious about what will come and I'm curious about what all of us as creatives and artists do because we're being challenged. Like we've never been challenged before, you know? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And some of us might've been uh, not, you know, some artists might have been uh, taking stuff uh, for granted and being, uh, you know, it wipes out the diva right away. It's just oh, kind of yeah. like, oh, fuck, I can't be a diva during the virus, you know? I mean, we are all faceless now when we go outside. We have no faces. There is no right. face. There's nothing. Right. You're a person trying not to get sick or get someone sick like every single other person. You have no fucking face anymore, you know? That Isn't is that wild? It's a fascinating concept, you know, um, really interesting. So, and that's that's a really crazy thing about comedy too, is you use so much of your face while telling the jokes, yep. and you're relying on the the audience's faces besides the laughs, the people that are stiff faced, the people that are kind of in shock, that kind of facial movements. It is all part of the rhythm and the 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 the, th the things that we need for timing of the bits. So that's pretty wild too. Yeah, I don't know. We need to become inventors. You know, we need to figure out some kind of thing to wear, or to be behind, or to sit inside of, or to something like. I don't fucking know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought my body condom idea was pretty good. That drawing that I put on Instagram, where I was like, okay, it's clear. It's very flexible. You pull yeah. the thing down, your, you can walk, you can move around, you can touch people. Uh, it's kind of hard to, to be heard, but you could, I bet you could scream out of it. I don't know. Yeah. But we need to get some like solid minds on the case. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. It's like uh, John Travolta, boy in the plastic bubble. That 70s movie. It's all of a sudden, here we are living that, you know? Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. You know, it was funny when I first moved into the apartment, sitting there late night, I could hear someone a couple apartments over with a 
fierce cop. And I was, all I thought was, oh, they got it. You know, it was like somebody in this building's got it. I can hear them just crazy cop. And so right. that was making me crazy of like, oh, I can't go out. I can't go out of this apartment. And then I was like, is it coming through the heater vents? You start going crazy. Oh my God. Well, imagine yeah. being in New York right now. You mean you just recently, fairly recently left New York, you know? Oh God, can you believe that? I mean, that's what I was thinking about, man. You know what? You know what? It's making me miss New York because I just watch. I'm just like the rest of the country, they're doing what they're doing, but nowhere has a problem like that. And that is just every morning I wake up and watch that press briefing and read every article. And it's like, I treat this like New York is everywhere, is everything, you know? Like, and it's, they're basically leading the country right now on what to do and how to deal with it. And I feel this incredible, but I just miss it there so much. I miss it so bad. I miss New York on a daily basis anyway, because it's like my favorite city in the world, but it is just right. breaking and it's like, it would be one of the very first things that I do is just go back there and walk the streets. I, I just, yeah. you know, this is so crazy. It's fucking crazy. That was the last, I think the last time, either the last time we hung out was at the Comedy Cellar in New York yeah. or the Comedy Store. One of the two, but we I spent we a great, yeah, we spent a great night at the cellar. You watched some comedy. We ate some food. We yeah. walked around. It was it's such a magical city in that in that comedy cellar and the store. Those are two of the places that I, I miss more than anything on the planet. They were just my my forts, you know, my tree. How are they houses. doing? Have you talked to those people? Mm-hmm. Like what's going on with how are they feeling about their business? Mm-hmm. How you know? Well, the comedy cellar and the comedy store, uh, I think one of the great things about that happened with comedy was the massive resurgence of it in the last eight years. So the store and the cellar were sold out two, three shows a night. Um, So there's probably a good little cushion there. Um, I talked to Noam. I did their podcast last week, uh, live at the Comedy Cellar. And he was the same way. He's like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but thank God that, that they own that place. And it's a small, small yeah. room, both those rooms. <clears throat> but, um, you know, I, like to me, some of my favorite comedy on the planet is the Comedy Store original room, which holds 189, and the Comedy Cellar, which I think holds like 110 or something. So I love doing comedy to small audiences. Um, so I wouldn't have a problem if I just worked at the store and the cellar the rest of my life. Yeah. Can't make, a, can't make a living that way, but I never got into it to make a living. That just sort of happened from hard work and... Uh, and then, you know, but the beauty of just being able to do the fucking art is really what I uh, care about the most. Yeah. Where, where are you at with comedy? I know that you love it. I see when you come to the shows. Uh, you've been an incredible, incredible friend and support of my comedy, which is so great because I love your art so much. Do you sit down and watch a lot of comedy? Are you a comedy nerd now? Or what's going on with that? I mean, I love it, Dean, because I think my favorite thing in the world is laughing. I mean, yeah. it's the best feeling possible. So, yeah, I do. I watch a lot of comedy. I started going to Zany's by myself all the time, like, last year. Great club. Great club. The best. It's so cool. Great club. It's, like, so close to me, and I just go and sit by myself and watch whoever's going on, you know? And it's great. Um, but yeah, I've watched like every stand-up special on Netflix. I don't, I don't know tons about comedy. I don't even know where to start. I just know that I love it and I always enjoy it, you know? In your mind, uh, since I played music all my life and then did it, have you ever sat around, because you, you do multiple forms of art, have you ever sat around and thought, Oh, maybe I could do this or a spoken word type Henry Rollins story type of tour or anything like that. Have you ever thought about that? 
I have thought about it recently because of that book Karma that I put out all about cars and there's a lot of writing in it and that book's coming back out. And so I've been asked a few times would I be willing to do something like that. Um, the idea totally terrifies me. I don't like, you know, you've seen me play. I don't talk on stage. Right. You know, there's I a lot of people like talk between songs and I just don't, I, I don't, I'm like already kind of into the next thing or whatever. And so I don't know. But I did a spoken word record recently that's not out yet that oh, was yeah? out in August for the book. And it gave me a lot of ideas because I didn't like straight read it. I couldn't, it was too boring for me to just straight read the stuff. Right. So I did lots of voices and characters and sound effects and things. And then like was acting out two parts of like scripted stuff. And, and I thought that's a kind of show I could get down with, you know? where it's more of a performance than it's like me, but just, I don't know. I, I need something to like get inside of and move around in, you know? Um, so maybe we'll see again, like that comes out in August and when we ever going to get to do something like this. So I've been starting to make lots of videos, like almost like curated like art films for each of these pieces. So there's a book and then there's a spoken word record and then that's become like a series of films. Um, that might be the best I can do at this time, but it's really uh, inspiring to me and exciting to keep pushing this one project into like every shape and form, you know, that I can come up with. So I think a, a cool thing to do would be to get in your uh, Challenger and you and I just drive across country, kind of like that movie Two Lane Blacktop. And we stop in these small type of theaters, these tetro type of theaters, and uh, and I just MC your spoken word book, fucking, you know, when you have a, a, a somebody to spin off of, yeah, it really okay. gets it really gets cool. Yeah, I w hey Dean, I would and do heartbeat, and That's then great. and then film that, and then film that. So yeah, you've got basically like this weird. And we go to places like Missoula, Montana, that theater up there. I think it's called oh, I know. Wilmer's. God, I love that theater. Yeah. You know, we go, we go to like, you know, places like that, back roads. Like when I ride the Sturges, I take the weirdest fucking scary no man's land route. And those are, those are pretty exciting things to do because as you're doing that, you're writing more for the show too of what's happening on the road. Yeah, no, it gets to change. It's the same thing when you're touring a record. By the time you're done with that tour three years later, man, those songs sound so different. They're like whole new animals. Yeah, they yeah. They get to grow, you know? And that's the thing I say about like the energy of other people. That's other people's input. That's how they build. That's how they become, you know, what they're supposed to be. And it's the coolest thing. As you're getting, as you're getting older, I... I like to ask people this because it's happened to me over the last five years. What music do you listen to now that you absolutely could not stand growing up? Uh, to me, it was Grateful Dead. And now I think, especially in this weird time, I, 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 I gravitated towards the dead during the political conflicts. And now with the virus, they mean more than ever to me. Uh, right. which is really kind of eaves my nerves, but who, who, anybody like that for you? Um, I'm not sure. I feel like I'm discovering older things all the time, you know, that maybe I did, that did not work with me when I was like in my full on punk days, you know? Right, now right. I just, now I just really appreciate a very, a good song, a well-written song that's performed in a way that almost sounds magical, you know? whatever kind of genre of music it is. Um, I'm way less picky or way less trying to make it define my style or who I am or who I think I'm supposed to be hanging out with. You know, that shit just goes away when you get older. You're like, I'm just me now. I'm not trying to like right. um, figure it out so much. So um, I don't know, I had a, like a thing, with, I have a Bruce Springsteen record, Nebraska, that I listen yeah. to all the time, but I would, I would never have listened to that when I was a teenager. I would have been right. like Springsteen, which is crazy. That just means I was a dumb shit because, yep, yep, you know what I mean? So it's that. It's like allowing just that thing where you 
had you have this idea about this name or this thing or this mainstream thing or whatever it is. Um, I had the same thing with the Grateful Dead a couple of years ago. Someone told me to listen to some songs or someone on like a jukebox, and I was like, "This is incredible! What is this?" And it was the Grateful Dead, and I was like, "What?" Right. Right. You know, like in like my instinct was to be embarrassed that I liked it. That's bullshit. <laughs> so. Well, you know, it's, so high, it's so high school of us, right? It's yeah, but you're like so trained up that way. You're like, you know, you gotta try to hang on to the street cred, you know, like I've, I've fucking got this street cred. I grew up with fucking this, you know, it's dumb, right? Yeah, yeah but I could listen to so much of that stuff that I wouldn't have listened to then now. And it, I find more pleasure in it than listening to whatever that punk band was when I was listening when I was like 12 or 13 that like, I, I can't even, uh, there's some of those records where I'm like, I can't believe I like listen to this over and over and over again. It's just like a flat fucking line. Yeah, yeah, where the yeah. hell is the song, you know? No, not not all apply because there's a lot of bands that I listened to when I was a kid, like Fugazi, which I could just listen to forever. Right. Like, they're brilliant. They're brilliant, yeah. you know? And there was just a lot of other stuff that was just cool. It wasn't well, cool. They, I mean, there you are. You got Ian MacKay, who, who is one of the uh, greatest pioneers of uh, the five dollar ticket and the full deep do it yourself and, the, and and that flavor. But at the same time, he absolutely worshipped Ted Nugent, Double Out Gonzo, which is uh, an amazing uh, thing for a punk rocker back in the day to like Ted Nugent, you know, that's Arena Cockroach. Well, that's every one of those guys has like the most varied, wild music taste. They're right. like true musicians, you know? They understand it all. They're, they, they're incredible players and conceptualists. So it's like, yeah, you can't stick yourself in this tiny little box and only listen to this one type of thing or this street cred thing and think that you're ever gonna grow as a musician or a writer or a performer or anything. You know, um, yeah. that's a life learning process. You know what I mean? It's like, I think that our minds open up to things as we get older and realize that was, a, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's just all we could handle at the time. Who knows? Who knows why? Yeah. I think it's pretty common, you know, to really hate one thing and really love the other thing. And there's no room for both. You know, it's like that thing where you're just like trying to define who you are. And I don't know. But yeah. 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 I, 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 I hear you. Bruce was exactly the perfect reference because that was somebody I definitely could not stand. And then one day I saw him play the Ghost of Tom Joad record from top to bottom. And I was like, what the fuck am I doing? This is, Holy but my brain, my brain had to be in the right space. And yeah. I had to, I had to get to Bruce through the long route of uh, Wilco and Sunvolt and the Jayhawks and Lucinda Williams' car wheels on the gravel road. I had to take this long route uh, to get there. And yeah. then when I got there, I was like, oh, that's where these guys are from. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah, you can't like ingest the entire encyclopedia of music history in one day and just get there. And thank you God we get did there it. Properly. You gotta get there on, in your own way, you know? Yeah. Can you imagine if we loved all the music when we started? We'd be out. We'd be out. Like, I was listening to Born to Run in the third grade. Fucking <laughs> on that record. Okay, Burrito Brothers? Oh, I was all over it in sixth grade. They didn't understand me. Then I went into craft work. Fuck you, you know? It'd be nuts. You'd, be some, you'd be some lunatic kid. Fifth grade craft work. That's when I first heard craft work was in the sixth grade and I immediately loved it and I knew I was weird in a way of like, what is this? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I learned it from the, the black kids at my camp because they were doing, they were popping, they were doing the robots all Trans Europe Express and we are the robots and they're from Oakland and I was like, what the fuck is this shit? I couldn't believe it, you know, yeah. so. It's wild to think where you get your, um, your, your, who turns you on to what, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. It's interesting. Yeah. Yet again, just 
It's a lifetime. It takes a lifetime. Let's talk about the car book a little bit. Uh, we just skimmed over that because we were talking about the spoken word, but you and I absolutely love cars. I, it's so funny, like, I, I think at another time, either uh, like we're twins, like we, or, <laughs> or, or we're like uh, supposed to be together on another planet. Like, what are you guys doing? You're the perfect couple. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, where did your car love start, and what was the first kind of car that you fell in love with? Um, well, my car love started when I was little because my dad was a used car dealer. It's very easy to work out exactly really? why, why I am because my mother was an art teacher, my dad was a used car dealer. Then you just smash them together, and then you get me. And um, so I w grew up around every day there was a different car in my driveway. Every day, like a different weird fucking car. And so I learned a lot about cars just by being around them all the time or seeing them like really like visually, I was very visually stimulated by them. I really liked how certain cars looked. And um, I think that became, began my whole thing. And then of course, I just, I don't know. I just loved fast cars. So the faster, the better the cooler looking, the better, you know? And I just, I don't know, I gave them like some sort of romantic power over me, I think. And I have such an appreciation for like the design of a car and the engine in a car and the sound of a car and the smell of a car. And like the fact that you feel like a superhero or you feel like you're like on an adventure or indestructible when you're in that thing faster than everyone else, you can get out of anything. It's a, it feels, makes me feel safe, you know? which is an interesting feeling that you feel safe in the middle of an adrenaline rush. It's like a wild combination. So I always loved cars, but then, you know, my first cars I ever drove were tour vans. This is yeah. just big ass clunky fucking cars with like a trailer on the back. It's not like you're like yeah. breaking any speed records. Um, I had a couple of little Toyotas when I was first learning to drive. They weren't very fast, but they were pretty cool looking. And, um, and then I moved to England and I didn't have a car for like 13 years. Right. And the reason I moved back to America, literally the top reason was because I wanted a Dodge Challenger and I wanted a garage to put it in. And yeah. I just, I bought the car before I bought the house, but I like ordered the car before I bought the house. And then I found the house and had the garage that the car would go inside of. It's like I bought my car a house. Yeah. That's what I yeah, 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 that's what I did. Yeah. I love it so much. And the reason I'm so obsessed with Challengers is because of that movie, Vanishing Point. Awesome. That movie, when I watched it, I just fell in love. And I watched it again and again, and I just stared at that car. I mean, that whole movie is like two hours of a car chase. Yeah. What, what other concept do you fucking need? It's nope. brilliant. It's perfect. It's the perfect have you movie. ever seen... Have you ever seen Two Lane Blacktop? I have, and I love it. Yeah, I think I think it's one of the greatest B films ever fucking made. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> oh my god! And then Death Proof, man, Tarantino, he did a good job of uh, of, of showing fucking love towards that genre, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I will watch any movie with any car in it that's going fast. Like you got me. I'm sold. I'll watch it. I'll see, I'll watch it. Um, yeah, I do love it, and I love I love dri like driving. Like even the way like the way driving is filmed. I don't know why I'm just so into that. I just oh yeah, I love it. Um, you know, and I love being. I think there's like a creative thing where it's like it does something to my brain. I like I write in my car a lot, so. I used to start back in the day, it was like really dangerous. I had like a notepad and a pen, you know, this is like before phones and a uh, little mini recorder. I was just like literally driving and writing at the same time and practically crashing. And I finally invested in a little tiny handheld, you know, tape recorder. That, yeah. that made me a safer driver, I would say. Um, because my brain just, it's like so fast when I'm in the car. So it like, it sort of really focuses and I come up with lots of ideas and I think it's that like moving, like just that constant moving, like all this stuff blurring beside me gets me like really hyper-focused. And um, I don't know, I've always just found it the most relaxing and inspiring 
situation. So I was the same way on the motorcycles, you know, because you have your brain has to constantly be paying the fucking ten, attention. So when I'm on stage, it, it, I I can just deliver stuff lightning speed because that's the moves I make on the freeway. Oh fuck a ladder. Oh shit an old tire, this guy's coming in my lane, all that shit. That's how I yeah. would deal with comedy as far as like, oh, this fucking guy's talking, this person's sleeping, that one fucking, you know, whatever. And you, you learn your brain, and that's how you are on stage, you yourself. It's constant movement of, uh, you know, getting <laughs> out of the way and, uh, and, 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 and just feeling it. That's when you drive, you're feeling it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really it's really interesting. I don't know what that is, but it's great. It's like it's some other second nature it kicks in, and it moves way faster than you on a normal day. It just moves at a different speed. And, you know, I notice that on stage where I'm like, how do I have, like, this incredible balance? I don't have that normally. You know, like, just walking yeah. around. Or, but then suddenly... I have incredible balance. It's like, I'm not thinking about it. I don't have time to think about it. It just works. It just goes and some, I'm here and then suddenly, how the fuck did I get over there? I don't know, I'm over there. Well, how am I to get on top of that thing? I don't remember making that choice. It just, my, just, I went, you know, and it's really cool. So yeah, there's something about that that is really awesome. I oh, you're, you're an incredible live performer. Oh my God. I remember the first time I saw you, I was like, Oh, what the fuck? This is on. You know? <laughs> it was on. It was at the El Rey. And I was up in the balcony up there in the VIP land. And um, you came out and it was just fucking, all right, take some fucking names. You know? <laughs> take some names. I love it. I love it. Let me ask you, you're in Nashville. I've spent quite a bit of time in the last my a few years in Nashville, and I just, I really love it. Uh, my good friends live out there. Jay Buchanan from the Rival Sons, one of my favorite humans. And Marcus King is out in um, East Nashville. And you're in this uh, big kind of uh, music mecca. Have you ever thought of doing yourself kind of a Lucinda type, alt country, maybe Burrito Brothers? Uh, you know, Towns Van Zandt type of record yourself? Um, yes, because I write like that all the time. So maybe, maybe someday. It's funny. It's like I kind of, because I get so focused on the kills and that's what I'm doing. But that record is already written. You yeah. know, I already have that. And it's been so fun with these last two singles. The other one that's coming out on May, March, May 13th. Yeah, May 13th. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> both of those songs are songs that well the one the second one is one I wrote last year but it totally kind of falls into that category you know I write a lot of slow songs with strong melodies and um they're kind of they're sort of straight and then I have to weird them out you know but it's just like here's the song this is the song now how do you want to like make right. it interesting? um but but I have so many of those and I always like to find a real the right home for them um, cause a lot of that stuff doesn't work with the kills. It would really not work with the dead weather and you can always try it. You can always change it so much that it kind of does, but you don't really want to fuck up a song yeah. just to make it fit. You know what I mean? It's like, there'll be a home someday. So yeah, maybe one day I'll do it. But, um, right now, I mean, yeah. Uh, like, like to me. I think that Beck has the ultimate career because he didn't box himself in and you didn't box yourself in because all the projects sound different, but he goes from, let's say, Odile to Sea Changes Crazy. and, so and you're just like, whoa, I fucking love Sea Changes more than anything he's done, you know? And, and, wow. and Odile, Odile is fun as hell too. And, and his newest record is insane. So what a, what a, what a great, and you have to not have fear. This is what I always uh, get down on classic rock bands as much as I love them. 
they they stop pushing themselves somewhere along the way where they just go out and they pay, play the same 15 songs because they're like, well, the fans don't want to hear the deep tracks. And I just, I'm like, but what about you? I know. You know? Yeah. What about you? I would lose Doesn't, my fucking mind. Oh, like, you know, I have a hard time. The only thing I have the problem with comedy is after six months, I'm done with the stuff. And most people kind of refine it for a year or two and then tape it and put it out. But to me, part of the journey, most of it is the mining for gold, the finding something. There's got to be a better song. There's got to be a better melody. There's got to be a better lyric. There's got to be a better fucking joke. Yeah. Let's find that. And, and, and if the audience goes away, fine. That's my favorite part of the Beastie Boys movie. They said, we hated who we became on License to Ill. We put Paul's Boutique out. It kind of, the audience disappeared, of course, which was genius. It, it wiped the slate of the frat rockers. And yeah. then by the time they put Check, the head out, Check Your Head Out, they're playing clubs. But they said something there that was great. They go, we're playing in front of 200 people that we wanted to hang out with. Yeah. And that's all you really want in art is other people. That's why I love going to a long dinner with you and friends. And we go from leather jackets to fucking music to paintings to comedy to cars to architecture to life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, it's, it's really wild. Let's, let's talk before, I know you got to get out of here, but let's talk real quick about these singles. What are they? Is a record, solo record coming out or are you just dropping singles? Uh, you did one with a video that was fucking smoking with the low riders. God, I, I, I cannot tell you how much of a low rider addict I was about 30 years ago i fell in love with the 65 impala everybody else likes the 64 because that's the dr dre ice cube i yeah. love the 65 it's the fastback not convertible with the three tail lights in the back the 396 my buddy had it with the four on the floor man with the console i was a low rider fucking addict then i fell in love with mr cartoon low rider bikes the whole fucking thing man so yeah. let's talk about the video and these songs. All right. So these, these are just tracks going out. They're not the rise was the first song and it, I wrote it for a TV show actually, but I wrote it in 2013 and then somebody needed a certain type of song for this TV show. So I knew that it was exactly what they needed. And I, I sent in that song which was just a, like an acoustic demo at the time. And they ended up using it. And then they ended up asking me to record it properly to do my version of it. Like, how, how do I see the song, you know? So right, I was so right. pumped to be able to actually record it how I wanted to. Um, and then the record label loved it and put it out. So there is no game plan. There's no like record that's hanging in the background that I'm gonna surprise everyone with. Um, but the second song is a song. So, okay, so we'll talk about the music video songs coming out label get in touch with me we're in lockdown they're like we need a music video i'm like well great i can't work with anybody you know i'm i'm, I'm at home right the only footage i had on my video camera was of those low riders that like a week and a half before i had been in la and i went to one of those like low rider cruises on a friday night which are illegal and they just like name a spot and people go right and where was it it was like somewhere in East LA. I can't even remember. I mean, like literally I was like, is this next to a jail? It was somewhere weird. It was, it was just nowhere, you know? Right. Um, and it was so incredible. It was just insane. I talked to everybody, like people wanted to tell the stories about the cars and the families and the histories and showing me all the details. And I mean, I was in heaven, Dean. I was totally in heaven. So I filmed mm. all this stuff. And then I came back and I'm like, okay, all I have is that, but it's actually perfect for the song. So. Then I shot myself in my house singing the song three times and then spent the next four days like teaching myself iMovie. How the Love fuck it. does this work? Holy yeah. shit. Um, that was a really fun slash nightmare experience. <laughs> right. And then, um, but it was great. And then I had a music video and like I just made it and I made it for like zero dollars, you know, and I was pretty stoked. Um, 
And then the second song is called It Ain't Water, which I wrote late last year and recorded early this year with Alan Johannes, who's the guy that's like produced Queens of the Stone Age and PJ oh, Harvey yeah. and Mark Lanigan and like basically like the list of my favorite musicians, you know. So I was so excited to work with him. And I recorded that in a couple of days in LA with him. And then, yeah, and then I got out of there and I was here. So then I made a music video for that too, which I can't wait for you to see. No, I can't um, wait. I can't wait. Now I'm, now I'm obsessed with making music videos and that's this all I'm going to be doing in lockdown, basically. Just writing music just so I can make the video. I think that's my new angle. Well, that's what I love about this era. Um, it's <laughs> forcing us. Like, I didn't know how to podcast eight and a half years ago. And I've been in music all my life. I was just an idiot. I was like, oh, that's got to be hard. You put it into Pro Tools or GarageBand, and then what? Like an idiot. Like, what do you mean? I've been <laughs> behind a 24-track board, dropping in overdubs, splice and tape for most of my life. And I'm acting like, that's scary. But it's actually kind of lazy, too. Yeah. And once I learned to podcast on my own, the freedom I have out it's here awesome. in the yeah. TRD Toyota 4Runner. You know what I mean? The freedom. And <laughs> now, look at you. You're going to make it. You made another video. And then it's like the next thing we're going to shoot us a, a short film of us in the car cross country doing a spoken <laughs> word thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, 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 and when you learn that shit, it really takes off the shackles and you don't have to answer to anybody. That's my only thing I hate in life in art is when you go, hey dude, can you come by and do this? And they go, well, I'm kind of swamped right now. And you're like, fuck, that's frustrating because the way our minds work is we do not have downtime. Yeah. It's like, let's go now. And they're like, well, I got kids and I got to teach them some stuff, homeschooling. You're like, fuck, you know? So <laughs> next thing you're, I'm I'm looking forward to your your film project, you know, Thank like you. right now. I mean, absolutely, it's going to be tons of little short films, but I'm getting so obsessed with them because I'm like, there ain't no fucking rules now. Like, I'm just going to do whatever the hell comes to me, as weird as it gets, whatever it is. Like, I'm yeah. figuring it out as I go, and it's really kind of saving me right now, you know, to sort of discover this new thing and to sort of tackle this, tackle these new problems I've never you know, yeah. confronted with. So I'm having a good time doing it. I'm not mad about it. No, I think, <laughs> I think the thing to learn right now, and this is really what I should be doing, is learn how to animate because animation is going to be bigger than ever since we can't get together and shoot TV shows. You can't be on a set with 50, 100 people, 200 people. It's yeah. going to be about animated shows. We're going to see more animated series in the next two years than you've ever fucking seen and right now we got great ones like bill burr's epis for family and duncan trussell has a brand new one out on um on netflix work and this new acid show coming out this week where the animated people rock stars telling acid stories right uh animation because all of us can do the voices in our house with no one around somebody's on the computer making the animation and yeah. you've got a goddamn TV show or a video or anything. So yeah. I think that's going to be something I should really learn. I don't know if you ever saw Montage of Heck, the, um, the Kurt Cobain movie. Yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. The animation in that film is, to me, some of the greatest animation I've ever seen. Very the way cool. they. Oh, my God. Yeah. And right now... I don't know how to do it. And I'm dying to animate like 10 minute stories from each 512 episodes of this podcast. I have like Allison Mossart tells the story of seeing the low riders. And then we animate it with these animated low riders. And you're yeah. out there like, this is cool. You know? Yeah. That kind of shit. Little snippets, five minute stories. Yeah. Well, yeah. you can do it. Just st start with like stop motion where you could do, I mean, you say you can't draw, but you could take like cut out a picture of a low rider, take yeah. a photo of it, twist it, take another photo of it, twist it, take another photo of it, twist it, take another, and you just have it go whirl, whirl, and you put it in order. You can I do stuff it. like, I mean, you could get real fucking punk fanzine on this. It would be cool. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Claymation. Claymation is my Claymation. Thing, you're just thing. like just using clay all day in your house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Just I'm the new Gumby. I'm the new Gumby. <laughs> With your green I'm the new Gumby. And instead of Pokey, I got fucking a French bulldog. Yeah. <laughs> Gumby and Yoki. Yoki. Fuck. Guys, the you limit. Any, do, do you got a dog? Yeah, there's a dog here. Yeah, Cash. He's running around. I keep looking at him. I keep seeing him in the yard. Just zooming by. You got a dog. I want a dog. This makes me want a dog these times more than anything. Yeah. It's a good time to, to get a dog. Do it. It is. It is. I know. I know. Well, I got to get out of smoke hut. I don't want the dog be getting secondhand smoke. My French bully over there just going, hey, dude, I can barely breathe already. And now I'm around these goddamn cigarettes. You know what I mean? You know, French bully around cigarettes just. They you know, smokers, imagine? smokers bark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my, God. my neighbor's got a, a French bully named Boris. And I walk by every day and I see it. Hey, Boris. And he's, he hates me because I got a mask on, you know? Yeah. So he doesn't, he's scared of the mask. Dogs are going to be confused about that for sure. They're not going to like yeah. it. I don't think they'll no. like it at all. Yeah, well. Listen, I love you more than uh, anything. You, I, I could talk to you for hours, and, and we have talked for hours, and I, I just, I can't thank you enough for doing the podcast. No, I'm so Some happy, I'm glad you're doing it. Oh, my God. Awesome. I mean, I'm telling you, when you did it, it was a game changer because – I was locked into the people I knew from my past, but I loved all this other music and I didn't know the people. Mm -hmm. So to finally get you on, it really opened the door, I, I believe this, for like Josh Homme and all these other guys that I loved, you know? Yeah. <clears throat> which, is, which is amazing. And I cannot thank you enough for doing that. Oh, well, you're so welcome. It's always my pleasure. Always. And I, I still love that photo of you at the comedy store sitting next to my name signed on the wall because it, <laughs> it, it just means so much to me uh, being a paid regular at that club and then you coming to see me do comedy. And, and I didn't care about anyone else laughing but you, you know? <laughs> and it's always awesome to see you work. It's so great. It's the best. I can't wait for well, the next time. Let's just hope it's not too long from now. Okay, let's Positive tell everybody, you got, you got the single coming out on the 13th. What's the date today? The third? Second today. So the second, so a week away. Yeah. You have the spoken word record and the fo the uh, car photo book reissued, right? Yeah, in August on Third Man. Third Man, God. Still, still Jack White, dream guest of mine. Still dream guest. Mostly... <laughs> Mostly because I know he's a lot like, uh, for me, John Mayer. I had John Mayer on, and we went fucking everywhere. Or with you. With you, we went everywhere, you know? Um, my, my favorite story still is when Dead Weather were doing the, um, the record listening, private record listening for the fans, and they didn't let phones in there, and you knew everybody wanted a photo, so you hired people with Polaroid cameras to get photos with everybody in this small listening party, which was such a great fucking idea. And then Jack White and I are sitting there and I go, hey, let's get a photo. And he goes, okay, cool. And it's one of my favorites ever. The guy shoots it overexposed and it's just two blasted white faces. And I show it to him. I go, hey, can we get another one? This didn't come out. He goes, nah, that one's perfect. <laughs> and he was right. It's so much fucking funnier to have that on my mantle. And people go, what's that photo? And I go, oh, that's me and Jack White. And, and they're like, and, and they right. Probably, they probably think I'm lying. It's so fucking funny that I thought about making it my comedy record. You know what I mean? <laughs> just the, the cover of my album is just this blown out white thing of me and Jack White. <laughs> you know what I mean? If I did a, a comedy record at Third Man, it would just be that. 
Yeah. You know, wow. <laughs> okay. So singles out the 13th. Uh, Instagram is Allison Moss Hart, right? No, it's A Moss Hart. Just oh, A, a Moss Hart. Yeah. Right. And then, um, and then uh, the Kills record, you're going to start recording that, hopefully. Oh, real quick, who's producing it? Secret? Oh, no, yeah. Or Don't know. We'll make those decisions when we get closer. We've got about half the songs right now, and I know Jamie's sitting on a bunch he hasn't played me, so I don't know how close we are, but hopefully, definitely by the end of the year, it should be recorded. If we're not, 